Okay. But we, we should, should be. We should be live. Be live. So okay. I believe we're live, and uh, we are very fortunate to join this hour uh, by Paul Midland, who is a, a poet, an actor, uh, a performance artist, of uh, highest caliber. Uh, I think. I think you're also a playwright. Am I what? A playwright. A playwright. Um, I wrote one play. Yeah, I wrote a poetry play. In yeah, I did. I did. I did. I guess that right. counts. Okay. It counts. It counts. <laughs> so, Paul, really, really good to have you here. Uh, so you and I met in the scene. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of your experiences in poetry? I think it's how you start with poetry. Um, I got started in poetry uh, in high school where your English teacher just says, hey, it's time to do our write a poem assignment. And uh, we were at that portion of the school year in junior year in Chicago. And after we did sonnets and ballads, um, I just wrote one for fun. And my English teacher, uh, Dr. James Byron Hooks, uh, encouraged me to write another poem and another poem and another poem. And long after the lesson had ended, I was still writing poetry and haven't stopped since. So, yeah. So we have so a critic. Have a critic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this. You, you want to ask you a question? question. That's probably the best Because this guy, Daniel, is hating on me. Hey, Daniel. So, um, so we met through the poetry scene, um, and that's how you began poetry. But you, you went on to go on to, uh, you, you appeared. Um, at the Apollo on Deaf Poetry Jam, uh, on Verses and Flow, on you know any any time poets could get on television, it seems like you you managed you managed to succeed at that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to do poetry at the Apollo? Oh wow! Well, that was in I believe '01, and that was it was scary because whatever you did at the Apollo you had the potential to get booed. That was a big thing. You know, if you make it at the Apollo without getting booed, then, you know, you could do anything. <laughs> You're in New York. So um, I did a poem about uh, Amadou Diallo, which was kind of serious. Uh, he was the um, young man who was um, gunned down by police officers in the early 90s. Uh, and he had his hand on his wallet and they said it looked like a gun. And next thing you know, um, he's no longer with us. But um, what I learned from that was that um, I should have done uh, another poem, which kind of gave my true nature of, um, of poetry. I'm kind of comedic and interactive. So what I learned from that Apollo experience is uh, to just use my voice, my natural voice. A lot of the poems that I wrote with Dr. Hooks in high school, um, Encourage, he encouraged my, my natural voice, which had a, a, a hint of comedy in it. And that's how my style really, that failure really, really helped develop my style. So yeah, that's what I learned. So enough of failure, let's talk about your success. When you were on uh, HBO Deaf Poetry Jam, uh, uh, you did The Toothbrush. That was a phenomenally successful poem. Went viral on YouTube. It was at the time really celebrated, really beloved. Uh, uh, the toothbrush. Well, that that actually that's linked to the Apollo. Um, I should have did the toothbrush at the Apollo. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so again, I learned that I should do um, what I want. Uh, uh, the Apollo challenged your authenticity, you know, your, 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 your spirit of who you are. And at Deaf Poetry, it celebrated it. So um, once I knew who I was in terms of my voice and poetry, I use that platform to really, really let go. And um, that was in 05. And I, I knew that that was pretty much the style that I was going to be known for. Comedic, interactive, a um, little bit of drama, but um, mostly uh, theatrically influenced. Um, I grew up an actor because my father was an actor. And I kind of combined that with poetry and then developed my comedic voice which was influenced by Richard Pryor, Bill Cosby, and, um, and early, early comedians of the 80s. Yeah. Do you remember the, the toothbrush off, off, off top? 
do I remember the poem? Oh yeah, there's some poems you never forget. That was like the one that kind of put me on the map and um, yeah, yeah, I do. You do it? Do it. Oh, <laughs> I'll do a little bit of it. Okay, so, okay, so I'm a young man in my 20s and I'm pleading to a young man such as yourself about, um, about um, your life changing. So usually when you're in your 20s, it, you fall in love. It started, for me, it started with a toothbrush. And I thought that we were just friends, but something told me I should have known. Man, she was trying to move in. For 20 minutes, I stared at these lavender bristle brushes. I pondered this woman and all the repercussions, the devastation, the ramifications. She knows what it means, men. Beware of the brush. It's bigger than what it seems. She'll spend the night a thousand times. But if she leaves that brush and you go to sleep, you will dream of how your life will change in the course of one week. Monday, she leaves a toothbrush. Tuesday, is that her jacket? Wednesday, she leaves a makeup to, so I can get used to looking at it. And Thursday, it was lingerie. It's not funny. Thursday, it was lingerie. My sock draw space. Friday, I found her stuff all over the place. It was blow dries and curling eyes and fake nails and earrings. Is this your hair in my razor? What's this Essence magazine? And on Saturday, she said her draw space wasn't big enough. My socks are in the shoebox. The closet is full of your stuff. On Sunday, I walk in smelling this potpourri odor, but you might as well leave it because by then you know it's over. Is it over, Mac? Is it over? Hell no, it ain't over because this ain't how you used to live. When she come in here tonight, I'm going to tell her what it is. Hey, baby, how you doing? What am I doing? I'm reading. I'm reading this poem with my friend Matt, and this is the poem that I'm reading. See, you intend for me to spend a little too much time with you. So right now, this is what I'm doing, baby. And this is what Paul going to do. See, baby. It's a, excuse me, Matt. It's a few things that you fail to understand. Now, I love you too. Ooh. Damn. It started with a what? Toothbrush. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I don't act there. Um, that's, oh man, that's, that, that's so incredible. I, I, it takes me back to the days watching you perform. People, people have no idea the way you work a crowd. And all, all of us poets who, who were kind of well-known in the room were always scared because Paul was going to be like, isn't that right? <laughs> so when did you start, when did you start uh, making other poets uh, nervous like that? Well, um, wow. Um, well, again, it's the theatrical influence. The theater is very interactive in terms of being uh in the same room with the actors on stage. So you kind of feel like you're experiencing it with them. And when my poem, it has a first person voice. So I would do things that would make it interactive, like uh, ask you a question and I wouldn't begin the poem again until I got an answer. So in other words, it takes all the pressure off me and puts it on you. And I just took it a step further by, um, by, by including, by, by, by enhancing that, you know, without, Hopefully without touching anybody, because <laughs> you know you get real excited, you get in people's faces, but but just um, it, it really engages people because it forces them to listen. And if you can do that with humor, even better. So, so what was versus and flow like? Um, versus and flow. Um, let me see. It was a lot of fun. Uh, that was an opportunity for me to show my dramatic and comedic side. I um, I developed my style into combining uh, drama. Um, I would tell a story that would start off comedic and then somewhere down the line flip the switch. So you could start off laughing and then I'm just setting you up and all of a sudden things just take a turn and get really emotional. And I knew I could do it because of my theater experience, but versus and flow, allowed me the opportunity to uh, share that with the world. And it was, um, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun because it, again, you know, all artists seek validation and that definitely, um, it definitely validated that I just wasn't um, a one hit wonder or just funny all the time. So you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned, um, 
Yeah, I, I would always, I would always watch those, and, and and you would always flip it, and you always feel bad for like having laughed in the beginning. Where, but the way you were able to do that dramatic flip, the way you were able to take it from one thing to another, it was always like it was, it was actually really well structured. I don't think people people really caught how well that one, Thundercats, a few others. I don't think people caught really how well how well structured that was. What um, was it elements of like playwriting that that you that you could like you know like like almost like acts like act one, two, three. I mean, how how did that how did your writing process what was it like? Well, um, uh, I'm a storyteller. So uh, the early poems that I wrote in high school pretty much just kind of told a story from beginning to end. And they were a lot longer. But again, uh, like you said, it had a beginning, middle, and end. And I necessarily didn't have the slam influence that the West Coast had. Uh, I had the storytelling influence that I learned from Richard Pryor or Bill Cosby and... Um, and that gave me that that gave me that that structure that I still use today. So you, so you, you mentioned a background in theater. You also mentioned your father. Um, I remember um, you showing me clips of him uh, as a uh, Paul Robeson. He was just really, really stunning. So he did some amazing work. Can you tell us a little bit about your dad? Well, my dad did do Robeson and uh, in Chicago. I grew up in the front row to many, many plays uh, that he performed in, and he was always the lead. He was always uh, he had his, he has this big booming voice, and um, I watched his stage presence just command command the whole theater, and I just stood there in awe every time uh, he was able to command the attention of everybody, no matter what. It could have been Shakespeare, Othello, could have been Paul Robeson, it could have been a comedy. Whatever it was, he pretty much had a presence that uh, engulfed the room, and I, I, I watched it and absorbed it, and 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 he still acts today in Minnesota now. So yeah, yeah, it's my dad. Yeah. And so um, when you when you began um, when you were doing the poetry, there was a, there was always a kind of a concept of of. of Getting into theatrical productions and um, whatever. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the the play that you made? It was like a you did like a one man play, and then you did a, a play with other characters, well, didn't you? Yeah, I did a uh, a play based off of my poetry, but since uh, I had a storytelling and theatrical influence, it lended itself to characters. So I, what I did was I made all of my friends in the poetry community characters in my play, which um, which allowed them my poems to come to life. So I structured the play around a beginning, middle and end and uh, included all of my friends. And it was it was a once in a lifetime. It was a one night deal in 2007. And I will never forget that night. That was a lot of fun. So who were some of the actors that you had? Inside the play? Um, well, Joshua Silverstein, Siddiqui Bakari, there was Cayenne, there was Bomani, there was Artist Man Swa, there was pretty much everybody that was on the poetry scene back in 2007 was either in the audience or or watching. Cat McGill, um, yeah, it was it was anybody anybody that that I was cool with. <laughs> what you doing Thursday? Okay, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, directed by Nikki Skies. That was huge because um, Nikki Skies kind of pieced it all together. You know, she really believed in my work. She's a poet that now lives in, I believe she lives in Atlanta, but she's also a playwright, uh, a author, and wonderful director. So um, shout out to Nikki Skies for making that happen. Uh, we had Josh on. Uh, I had that. We. I'm talking about. I had Josh on the other night. Your staff, really? All your staff. <laughs> you did. Uh, I had Josh on the other night, and he uh, he mentioned um, he mentioned that he used to beatbox behind poets. Did he ever beatbox behind you? Yeah, yeah. Me and Josh have worked together or known each other for years, and you know I've been on shows of his, and he's been on shows of mine. And um, we've 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 worked together lots of times. He's a really good friend of mine, really good friend. I'm really proud of him. He's doing beatboxing now professionally for uh, what is it? Drop, drop the mic. Yeah, drop the mic. Yeah, yeah, that's my guy. He's also doing. 
he's started his own. He's really taking advantage of this coronavirus. Um, uh, uh, stay at home by just creating his own show every day at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. He's there with his family and he produces this morning show that starts at 11 o'clock. And it's just so informative and funny. And then he has an after show. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's really good to see people that you've came into the um, game with uh, grow like yourself. You're all over the world. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, I really appreciate that. You were actually, uh, I remember you, you, you were a huge influence or a huge encouragement influence. I mean, you, you really helped me out and you really, you really, uh, really, you really kind of gave me some really good advice at, at, at very pivotal times. So I, I, I'm deeply, deeply indebted. Um, so, you know, Josh has done very well, but you've also, I mean, you've also made some huge strides in, in recent years. So t tell us, what was it like being a, in a progressive commercial? Oh, wow. Um, well, uh, I didn't know what I was getting into. I, I just thought it was another commercial. And what they were looking for was uh, to begin a campaign that had uh, a, a group of coworkers that donned the famous white apron. And I was wearing the apron. I didn't even audition for that commercial. I auditioned for another one. And then they said, let's try them in that one. And that commercial was the one that spawned a series of commercials that included uh, five other actors who um, have huge improv resumes, usually from UCB, um, the Upright Citizens Brigade. And there I was just playing with these masters and I had no idea that this was gonna be a huge campaign. They just started, um, we shot a work from home series last week and the first commercial dropped. So uh, you can actually see the same background <laughs> minus the mirrors. You can see the same background um, on our latest commercials. So huge, huge blessing, changed my life and I uh, play a character named Alan. So you you were working with these with with people who have been trained at like the highest you know the 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 top of their field in terms of improv, and you kind of had this background in improving poetry a lot of a lot of trial and error on 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 the poetry stage. How did that what 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 carried over and what what did you have to learn? Well, that's a very interesting question because it was very intimidating. You know, Stephanie Courtney, who plays Flo, Jim Cashman, who plays Jamie. Um, uh, Jeremy Rowley, who plays Rodney, and um, ooh, what's her name? Mara, played by Natalie Palomides. And they are all like super, super skilled in improv. And here's this guy who just kind of did funny poetry. Uh, it was very intimidating because, you know, they yelled cut like five minutes ago. <laughs> and I was like, um, is there another script? Is there, you know, I'm looking for my script and these lines stopped. And what I had to realize was that I needed to develop my character from within because it's like getting on a moving train. It's like that train's been going for a while and you're just trying to fit in, you know what I mean? And uh, actually it takes a while to develop your voice when you're working with an ensemble, just like with any play or if you're on a show or something like that, you want to get the rhythm of how they work and how you fit in without uh, distracting, but complimenting uh, what they're trying to do. So I finally got a hang of um, my character and um, and it looks like I'm more comfortable. Um, I, I just got through watching like the beginning to where we are now. And it's just seeing, you can see the progress of how, how not just my growth, but my, my comfort. Is there a word such as comfortability? Comfortability. I was really rela relaxed. <laughs> comfortable, comfortable, kofefe. <laughs> so, so there's a world of difference between being able to deliver like a strong political poem and being able to do a po strong political speech. There's a world of difference between being a very funny poet and doing a stand-up comedy act. So I think people think that like the world of poetry, we, we can, we can kind of, poetry is not really anything. I mean, it's like, it's not, so it's not so tightly defined, so it could be anything, right? So we bring in elements of different things, but then when we actually have to do the thing, I mean, it's it's a whole other thing. Well, um, my father taught me uh, that theater is theater. And that just means that no matter if you're on a TV set, 
or, or, or doing a play, you know, acting is acting. And I applied that to funny being funny. I didn't understand why they cast me as Alan in the progressive commercial, but it wasn't for me to understand because I just was funny. And um, until I believed it, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough for me, you know? I had to believe it. No matter what anybody told me, I always felt like I wasn't good enough to be with these guys playing, you know? And then they would always tell me, no, you're great, man. You're killing it. You're killing it. You're bringing it. And I'm like, bringing what? What did I bring? You know? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yeah, it takes a while. It takes a while to develop that because, you know, you need to, you know, you need to validate yourself, you know, and that, that is hard to do. So you set a number of goals. Oh, oh. What do you say? So you set a number of goals. You've achieved many of them, and I'm I'm sure you have a number more goals to achieve. Uh, and yet you talk about um, that feeling of of doubt and insecurity. Um, some call it imposter syndrome. What advice do you have to give to people to to push through that and and, and still you know pursue what it is that they want in their life? You have to learn from your mistakes. You have to have experience. And that experience only comes from, from failing. Uh, you, you can't learn to be good at something until you know how not to be bad at it. So um, mistakes may not be super bad, but you can definitely do something better, you know? Um, constant constant training and rehearsal and you know and it's easier when you when you love what you do just like when you do your poems you know wow he's so passionate and he's so knowledgeable and it just effortlessly effort effort easily comes off of his mouth and he's just so gifted well that's because it's in you you know it's in you that's just your voice and the more you develop your voice as opposed to trying to be somebody else, you know, because I think that's a lot of the mistakes that actors make, especially young actors. Um, and they say, okay, so what can you be? Anything you want me to be. I can do anything you want. What do you want me to be? You know, and it's like everybody can't do everything. You know what I mean? It's like I, and at, not, at different times, you know, I can't, I can't be anybody else but me. And if something's meant for me, it's meant for me. And if it's not, it's not. And that's okay, you know. It's not okay, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, was Matt Damon intimidating? No, no, because um, it was a small scene, but the director just to kind of encourage me to be me, you know. He just said, "Okay, we're gonna do this scene. Now we're gonna call Matt over. Just give it to us, nice and easy, just like you did at the rehearsal." And I was like, "Well, I was just being myself at the rehearsal. That's it. That's what I want right there." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." So Matt came over, and you know, just said, "Hey, how you doing?" I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't really nervous because um, they said it's okay to be yourself. Yeah. Can you tell us about your that is bad actor. Say it again. Can you tell, Can you tell us about your experience on uh, Brooklyn? Uh, Brooklyn Nine. Nine. Oh, okay. Well, um, well, again, it's that moving train. Uh, I would get on set. I played the character called um, Officer Lou. I was on about four episodes, and not a lot of lines. But enough that they gave me a name, which was very cool. Uh, about the fourth episode, you know, I just got tired and I said to the whole cast, I was like, hey, everybody, I'm here. My name's Paul. And then they went, oh, hey, hey. And it's just like, you know, that moving train thing I was talking about. They have relationships with each other. And, you know, you're supposed to act like you know them and stuff like that. But what helps a scene for me is if you have like a conversation with whoever uh, that you're supposed to be doing the scene with, depending on the scene. You know, obviously if it's a big dramatic scene and you're dropping some big heavy news, you don't want to talk about it before. You want the 
reaction to be natural. But if it's funny, you know, you kind of want to like the person that you're about to do the scene with as opposed to sit next to them in the little director chairs while they're on their phone and they don't say anything to you for 10 minutes. It's like, hey, man, you knew we got to talk in a minute, right? You know, it's just like, come on. But every actor is different. Every, some actors don't even want to talk. They just want to do the scene and go to the next one. So you kind of you kind of have to roll with it. But Brooklyn Nine-Nine was a lot of fun because I got four episodes out of that, four or five. And that kind of established me as a, as a comedic actor because, you know, when you do a role, they immediately look at your resume and they go, ooh, he did this that many times, you know? So it really, really helps. Again, your resume is your, is your, um, your, your resume is your valid, is your, uh, what do you call it? Your resume is your, um, is your ticket to the next role. You know, it's like, you know, they'll never hire you for another role until they look at what you did. So Brooklyn Nine, uh, Nine got me downsizing, got me, you know, the next thing and insecure and, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's all connected. Well, moving right along, what was insecure like? Ugh. Why did I tell you that? Uh, <laughs> well, insecure, the opposite of being connected and knowing yourself and centered and relaxed, insecure was, um, it was a moving train, but um, I was in my head, which means that, you know, I was just overthinking it. You know, I was very, very intimidated by this young woman who is where I kind of want to be. You know, she's on her own show and she's starring in it. And I have a scene. It was so funny because the scene that was shown was I played a business owner and a, an investor and she was trying to get me to invest in her, you know, block party. This was the first episode of season four. So it really wasn't that long, but um, I, she was acting insecure and I was supposed to be the one with the power, right? Well, in reality, I was insecure and she was the one with the power. So I'm walking around on this set for three days, watching everybody brush the ground when she walks and throw rose petals. And all of a sudden, action. And she acts like she's insecure. I knew I was going to mess that line up the day I walked on set. There was nothing anybody could tell me. So it was time to shoot. And we never had our little meeting conversation. Hey, how are you doing? You know, it was just like, but it wasn't because she was like stuck up or anything. It was because she was too busy looking at right next week's episode. You know, it was just like, oh my God, this is really important. What if I mess it up? You know, <laughs> it, was, it was still, I had one line, one line. <laughs> and all I said was, Let me go again. <laughs> I did that five times. Oh! Five times. The director says, can we get a script supervisor over here? And oh. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> That's like the worst thing that you do with an actor. So like I said, you got to learn. But, you know, at the time, you know, I had friends in from out of town. I really wasn't doing what I usually do. I was, um, I, I was, I was in my head. You know, and and they hired me because of being natural. And I was just like, oh, my God, Issa Rae. This is amazing. Look, she's got her own tailor making and sewing the dress on set. You know, it was just like, wow. It was it was very, very intimidating. And she was like, oh, no, no, it's not like that. It's fine. I was like, you were so nice to my cousin. He told me he met you one day. And I was like. And she was like, yeah, yeah, and I was like, oh, man, I'm fanning out. I'm freaking fanning out. This is not the time. <laughs> I was fanning out. <laughs> they didn't hire me to fan out, man. Oh, it was terrible. Oh, it was terrible. Oh. And then we rehearsed it, and we were rehearsing yeah. back and forth, and the director just says, all right, cut. And I was like, what? He's like, well, cut. What does it mean? And we got it. You did. You got it? I was like, How? Well, we were rolling while you were rehearsing. I was like, oh, well, that was a dirty trick. Thank you so much. <laughs> natural. So yeah. I'm pretty sure they're not going to ask me back, but I definitely learned from that experience because yeah. you know I took for granted what I did on um, Downsizing with Matt Damon. 
You yeah. know, I said, oh, okay, I'm not nervous around big people. I'm not intimidated, you know? Yeah. A-lister, psh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, um, again, you got to know what it's like to fail before you can, um, before you can, um, what's the opposite of failing? Um, not failing. Not failing. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that taste. I don't like yeah. that taste at all. It will never happen again. Preparation, yeah. rehearsal, all that stuff. Well, do you think that you got intimidated um, by Issa Rae? Because obviously Matt Damon, I mean, like, I obviously Matt Damon is, is the bigger star, but, huh? You can't hear me? Uh-oh. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. Is it me? Am I muted? No, you're not muted. I can't hear you. All right, I'm going to stop and then I'm going to start again. 